Bombers, ICBMs, EMPs, nuclear weapons come in all shapes and forms. The Russian military inherited the largest nuclear arsenal on Earth from the Soviet Union. Today, we take a look at the nuclear capabilities of Russia. From small yield tactical nuclear weapons to rumors of doomsday tsunami torpedoes like Poseidon. Because these weapons make the war in Ukraine the greatest threat to the human race. Welcome to Dark New World. On July 16, 1945, at 5.29 am, the world changed forever. It was the Trinity Test, conducted by the United States Army, the first detonation of a nuclear weapon. Since then, the world saw a massive arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union to produce the biggest, most deadly nuclear arsenal on Earth. For almost 80 years now, humanity lives with these weapons. They changed the way we fight wars, or, and that's the better interpretation, how geopolitics worked in the post-World War II world. There are many different types of nuclear weapons. First, the atomic bomb. The enormous amount of nuclear energy that is released by this process produces a large amount of heat and electricity. A nuclear weapon's explosive power is measured in yield, which is expressed in tons of TNT. Fission, or atomic bombs, can be as small as one kiloton of explosive power, or as large as several hundred kilotons. This is in contrast to the much larger thermonuclear or hydrogen bombs, which can be a thousand times bigger than atomic bombs. They are expressed in millions of tons of TNT, or megatons. The US is the only country to have used an atomic bomb in war. The first, nicknamed Little Boy, was dropped on Hiroshima, Japan, on August 6, 1945, with a yield of 15 kilotons, and the second, Fat Man, was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, on August 9, 1945, with a yield of 20 kilotons. However, over time, atomic weapons, which basically followed the Nagasaki Fat Man design, began to get smaller and lighter with greater yield, becoming more efficient. Compact atomic bombs directed to hit a city directly could still cause casualties in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Then there are thermonuclear weapons, often referred to as hydrogen bombs or H-bombs. They are nuclear weapons in which the extreme explosive powers are obtained through the process of nuclear fusion, the process of forming a heavier nucleus from two lighter ones. This fusion requires incredibly high temperatures. They are nearly all achieved through the initial detonation of an atomic bomb. Like atomic bombs, the explosion of an H-bomb produces a blast that can destroy structures within a radius of several miles. Extreme heat that can spark firestorms, and intense white light that can induce blindness. Radioactive fallout, or the release into the environment of highly unstable fragments or byproducts of fission such as cesium-137 and strontium-90, can poison living creatures and contaminate air, water and soil for hundreds of years. These weapons can be thousands of times more powerful than atomic bombs and are measured in yield equal to megatons of TNT. And yet, they can be made small enough to fit into a ballistic missile warhead or an artillery shell that can be carried. In 1952, the US was the first nation to successfully test a 10 megaton fusion bomb. Although they can be much more destructive than atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs are also much more difficult to create. The difference between an atomic bomb and a hydrogen bomb can be staggering. For example, a bomb with a yield of Little Boy, the bomb that the US dropped on Hiroshima, would destroy most of Manhattan and cause 400,000 instant deaths. A fireball with a radius of 200 meters would turn everything in and close around it into ash in seconds. In a radius of almost one kilometer, the heavy blast damage would destroy concrete structures and the shockwave would almost kill everyone. In a radius of four kilometers, you would get third degree burns when you're outside when a detonation happens. But these numbers are all small compared with a hydrogen bomb. Ivy Mike, the first hydrogen bomb, had a yield of roughly 10 megatons. If a warhead like that would explode over the same area in Manhattan, the casualties would be in the millions. The fireball alone would have the diameter of almost 7 kilometers, leaving nothing but rubble in Manhattan. The blast radius would destroy most of the buildings in New Jersey and Brooklyn, and even 30 kilometers away from ground zero, people would get third degree burns. An entire metropolitan area like New York could be wiped out with just one warhead. The fact that thousands of these warheads are pointed at the enemy and ready to launch 24-7 sounds much more scary now. And the war in Ukraine changes from a regional war to a global emergency situation. But this is not even the biggest warhead that exists. Here we start looking at the Russian nuclear arsenal. In his address to the Federal Assembly in March 2018, Russian President Vladimir Putin revealed the existence of five major nuclear-capable weapons programs. Dubbed Putin's superweapons, 
these new systems signaled Russia's determination to produce innovative solutions to emerging military threats, principally those emanating from the US. Four of these systems unveiled by Putin can be described as strategic insofar as they are all long-range weapons, which means that they possess a range greater than 5,000 kilometers. The first of these superweapons is the RS-28 Sarmat Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. The super-heavy liquid-fueled ICBM has been under development by the Makhayev Rocket Design Bureau since 2009. The Sarmat is expected to replace the Soviet-era RS-36M, better known as Satan. It should be capable of carrying a range of different payloads, including a mixture of re-entry vehicles and decoys to overcome ballistic missile defenses. The most notable difference between the Sarmat and its predecessors are its claimed long range and its ability to attack via fractional orbit to approach targets, raising the possibility of it being able to approach the US via the South Pole, thereby bypassing existing missile detection and defense systems. The Sarmat may also carry the avant-garde hypersonic light vehicle in the future. The novelty of the avant-garde lies in the fact that it does not, like conventional ICBM re-entry vehicles, follow a ballistic trajectory outside the Earth's atmosphere for the majority of its flight. Instead, the hypersonic light vehicle spends most of its journey traveling at high speed in the upper atmosphere. While the hypersonic aspect of the avant-garde is often emphasized by the commentators, it does not in fact travel as fast as a conventional ballistic missile. The operational utility of the system is instead derived from its ability to maneuver while in the atmosphere, enabling it to evade interception by existing missile defense systems. The existence of Poseidon nuclear-armed, unmanned, underwater vehicle, short UUV, was first revealed publicly in November 2015, when broad details became available after photographs were taken of program schematics in a Ministry of Defense meeting. Initially known as the Oceanic Multipurpose System Status 6, or simply Status 6, it was characterized as a large, autonomous and fast nuclear-tipped torpedo. After the system was renamed as the Poseidon in 2018 by a public poll, Putin and other defense officials steadily revealed more information about both the systems and its intended role. According to Putin, the Poseidon is a multipurpose UUV that can carry either conventional or nuclear warheads which enables them to engage various targets, including aircraft carrier groups, coastal fortifications and infrastructure. It is also powered by a miniature nuclear reactor, giving it unlimited range. The Poseidon is also reported to be capable of diving into depths of 1 km, rendering it safe from existing manned submarines. Russian State TV claims that the weapon system could create a 500 meter tall tidal wave that could destroy the United Kingdom. It should be obvious that this is complete nonsense and couldn't be further from the truth. The amount of energy to cause a tidal wave, even in the scale of a normal tsunami like the one in 2004, is in the area of gigatons. Rumors say that the torpedo could be equipped with a warhead with a yield of 100 megatons. The biggest nuclear warhead tested is the Tsar bomb, which had a yield of 50 megatons. So everything beyond that remains a theory. Any conventional nuclear strike on a city would cause more deaths than the small wave that Poseidon could trigger, if there is a wave at all. The 9S7760 Kinzhal air-launched ballistic missile was the only sub-strategic system unveiled by Putin in 2018. It is a modified variant of the Iskander ground-launched ballistic missile, but it's launched by the MiG-31K missile carrier, a modified version of the MiG-31 Foxhound interceptor. The MiG-31K is used to launch the missile at high speed, thereby boosting the speed of the Kinzhal. The Kinzhal therefore, like the Iskander, follows an aeroballistic flight profile. According to Putin, the Kinzhal eventually reaches a speed of Mach 10 and is capable of maneuvering throughout all phases of its flight trajectory. It is reported to possess a range of around 2000 km from the point of release from the MiG-31K. It has also been reported that the Kinzhal will be launched from the supersonic Tu-22M-3M backfire bomber that is under development and, further in the future, the Su-57 Fallon 5th generation fighter aircraft. The Kinzhal differs from the strategic systems described above, both in range and likely in mission. As a theater weapon, it is capable of being fitted with both nuclear and conventional warheads, and therefore of being used in a broader range of missions. Russian media reports have suggested that the Kinzhal would be used for anti-ship missions, as well as strikes on US ballistic missile defense facilities. It is also plausible that it was designed to attack time-sensitive or other high-value targets at intermediate range without violating the now defunct Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces short INF treaty, which prohibited the deployment of ground-launched intermediate-range ballistic missiles. 
Several recently published journal articles by Russian military scholars have mentioned other possible roles for the Kinzhal. These include non-nuclear strategic or serving as a tool to disrupt multi-domain operations by the enemy through preemptive strikes at the infrastructure critical for such operations. But why is Russia developing such systems? While much of the political and military planning in Russia is focused on seeking a balance of power in strategic nuclear systems, the development of the substrategic superweapons is driven by a sense of inferiority in other areas. Fears that Russia might be vulnerable to a sudden and decisive US naval or aerospace blitzkrieg are surely important factors in explaining the emphasis on the development of theater-level hypersonic missiles such as the Kinza. Rather than developing these capabilities for passive purposes, for example, to defend against the carrier-based forces that might be threatening Russian territory, it is likely that they represent a step towards Moscow being able to threaten the territory of potential adversaries with similar capabilities to those that Russian defense planners have long feared. But even without those new superweapons, the old ICBMs and air-launched warheads are enough to destroy the modern world. It's the sheer number of warheads that makes this equation so dangerous. And if that's not enough, we still have to worry about tactical nuclear weapons or so-called non-strategic nuclear weapons that could be used on the battlefield. Such weapons are less powerful than strategic nuclear weapons, though the explosive yield can vary widely. These warheads aren't connected up to delivery systems, but kept in central storage facilities in Russia. Another overlooked aspect of nuclear weapons are EMPs. The enormous potential of an electromagnetic pulse released by the high altitude detonation of a nuclear weapon has been recognized for some time. In 1962, the US conducted an atmospheric test of a 1.45 megaton thermonuclear weapon, codenamed Starfish Prime, 250 miles above Johnston Island in the Pacific Ocean. Over a thousand miles away, the blast knocked out electricity supply in parts of Hawaii and disrupted telephone service for a period of time. In addition, radiation from the test damaged several satellites in low Earth orbit, taking them out of service. Decades later, the Commission to Assess the Threat to the United States from Electromagnetic Pulse Attack determined as early as 2008 that the US would face catastrophic consequences from an EMP attack, given its growing dependence on electronics of all forms and complete reliance upon the electrical grid. In a nuclear war, most people would die because of the collapse of the infrastructure, not the bombs themselves. Russia and the United States have the two biggest arsenals of nuclear weapons. The war in Ukraine pushed Russia closer and closer to a situation in which the use of one of these weapons could be considered. As an interesting fact, Ukraine possessed nuclear weapons in the past itself. At the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, Soviet nuclear weapons were deployed in four of the new republics – Russia, Ukraine, Belarus and Kazakhstan. In May 1992, these four states signed the Lisbon Protocol, agreeing to join the treaty or the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, with Russia, the successor state to the Soviet Union, as nuclear state, and the other three states joining as non-nuclear states. Ukraine agreed to give up its weapons to Russia in exchange for guarantees of Ukrainian territory from Russia, the United Kingdom and the United States, known as the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances. China and France also made statements in support of the memorandum. As the world is heading into a phase of conflict and chaos, nuclear weapons will stay the biggest threat for humanity. As long as there are these weapons, on both sides. It's not a question if it happens, but when. Let's hope we won't see it in our lifetimes. And what if it comes to a direct confrontation between Russia, China and NATO? Well, in this video I talk about the World War III scenario. If you like this video, then like and subscribe. And on the right, I talk about the global food shortage we have to face. My name is Dennis, thank you for watching and goodbye.